Yeah, so The Great Heresies and Characters of the Reformation. Have you heard of these books? I've read them. I read them when I was in high school. Are they good books? They're great books. Moreover, for uh, O Thou Who Was Tossed, if they were like ice, read them and weep. No, I, I, I kid. These are two huge books, um, very famous books. Uh, I will read the back cover because you might be wondering, what are the great heresies? What are the great heresies? Uh, and they're stated uh, Arianism, Mohammedanism, Islam, Albigensianism. Mm. I actually don't know that one. I do. What is that? It's the fun one. <laughs> oh, okay, I guess you're gonna have to. We're gonna have to read to find out. I guess. Yeah. And then uh, the two obvious ones: Protestantism, Modernism. Boring. No. Been there, <laughs> done that. Been there, <laughs> done that. Um, yeah. So important. But I've been wanting to read this book too. This is this is pretty high up there on my to read list. Characters of the Reformation. Who are some of these characters we got here? Lots. Lots? Why should we read this book? Well, you should. No, but why? Oh, because you'll get to know characters you don't really know. I mean, King Henry VIII, Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Thomas Cromwell, they're all, by the way, um, they're pan-continental. Because you've got Queen Elizabeth, Mary Tudor, Mary Stuart, King Henry IV of France, James I of England, Ferdinand II, who was the Holy Roman Emperor during the Thirty Years' War. Mm -hmm. uh, Gustavus Adolphus was King of Sweden, Richelieu, Laud, Oliver Cromwell, William of Orange, William XIV. I mean, it's great in that they show you the Reformation as a transnational phenomenon, not just English-speaking countries. Mm. Um, what was they going to ask? Well, who's your favorite Catholic historian? Is it Bella? That's hard. Who are you thinking? Who, who's, who's in the, who were the, the uh, contenders on this one? Well, I mean, if you're going to save all time, yeah, uh, probably Bellick, although he's very deficient when it comes to French history. Oh, what a cardinal sin. It is. <laughs> it is. But the reason for that is that he was a relative of Danton. He was one of the French revolutionaries. And so he had to somehow defend the French Revolution on Catholic grounds. Oh yeah, we got a lot of questions. What's with the affinity for from uh, both Chesterton and Belloc about those things? Well, Chesterton's affinity was because of Belloc. He, Belloc was basically his interpreter of all things French. <laughs> okay. And then Belloc himself, as I say, uh, his problem was that he was a relation of Danton. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you'll find about the French is that they're very family-minded. Uh, probably if there had been revolutionaries in my family, I might very well uh, come up with all sorts of weird reasons why they weren't as bad as they were. Fortunately, I was spared that horrible, horrible, horrible cross. But he wasn't. So, when it comes to French matters, I would recommend a uh, another historian. Uh, this is in English. Bernard Fay, F-A-Y. Oh, I, we might sell his books. If not, I know that name. Yeah. Uh, is, is best as a corrective to Belloc's work in Fra on French history. Okay. Is uh, Louis XVI or the End of a World. Now, another individual that I would point out, she was a novelist, but she wrote a historical novelist. And that was a lady called Jane Lane. And the period she covers in British and English and Scots history is basically from the time of Mary, Queen of Scots, to um, 1802 or thereabouts. And also uh, Robert Hugh Benson, Monsignor Robert Hugh Benson. Oh, I definitely know that name. Yeah. yeah, he wrote some very, very good historical novels. Did he write Christ the King, Lord of History? No, no that's... that was William Carroll. Okay. Um, okay, uh, so other than the French aberration, Belloc is absolutely... Yeah. Okay, I have one question for Great Heresies. I've heard this a long time ago, and I thought it came from this book. And it was a, a proposition set forth by Belloc. He proposed... First off, he saw the rise of Islam already. Right. And he saw it growing. He predicted it was going to grow more. And what I heard is that he predicted that the threat of Islam 
would galvanize Christianity into revitalizing itself again. Chris, Chris, Christendom would be revitalized because of the Muslim threat. Yeah. Did he say that, and do you agree with that? Yes and yes. Wow, okay. I didn't know you, you agreed with it mm -hmm. on that one. That... I believe. I mean, I think we're already seeing the first signs of it in Central Europe, and even in Western Europe, because these people like Orban in Hungary, uh, and some of these other folk in the rest of Europe who send our liberals into little paroxysms. Oh, I could just twerk this waffle. Well, those are precisely the people, the type of leader who will arise in uh, Europe's last extremity. Now, see, I would agree with that on the basis that it's a logical reaction. No. But, see, the problem why I haven't that I have reservations about it is that liberals are not logical. They're not, as you say, children of the uh, children reality of the has lie. nothing uh, on children of the lie. So how can we? The, are the liberals going to flip on this and say, "Yeah, we need a, we need a, to stop no, this"? They won't flip, but because they won't be able to rule, they won't be able to deliver the bacon. Let me explain something about life. When a rulership are no longer capable of dealing with reality, because they're living off in Zululand, off yeah. in, the, in the stars somewhere, and reality gets too tough for them to deal with, they generally lose their control, and somebody replaces them. Okay, well, I was talking about liberals in general. I mean, like, like not Liber just a leadership. Well, the leadership won't matter. I mean... The vast majority of people have no opinion about anything, really. Well, when you say the leadership is what matters, I mean, you you say every government gets the leadership. Every every, every nation gets the, the, the government it deserves. That's true. So it's a great mystery. There's the a chicken, chicken and the egg. egg. You're absolutely right. But having said that, the people are funny. When it's a choice between adherence to moronic leadership and dying, the masses are generally wiser than their masters. Okay, so you're saying liberals are going to lose their constituency. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, look at Weimar Germany or Imperial Japan. People will turn on, if they think their lives and their livelihoods are at stake, they will turn on a dime. Does that apply? I know you've always applied that to Europe. Does that also apply to America? That, my dear, dear Vincenzo... Is the great six dollar question? I don't know. Yeah, because we are different. We do not turn quickly. Although that may not be entirely true. I mean, when I was born, there was still a lot of people willing to defend segregation. Now it's the second worst sin. It's interesting. Uh, but, that, but day, that's fused with our, our national religion. Uh, I, I know it is. But uh, into it too, though, think of just the way the home stuff has gone in your day. I mean, when you think back to when you were a teenager, the idea of gay marriage was ridiculous. And now if you don't accept it, you're a homophobe and a higger and a beta. That's interesting. So, well, again, the commonalities is that it got fused into national religion, so all else equal... Uh, this handling of the a Muslim threat would have to somehow get fused into the national religion. Yeah, and, and, and something would have to happen to us, uh, at least as bad as the uh, Twin Towers. I mean, basically our little revenge would have to be smacked hard. I hope as not as hard as uh, Star Spangled Crown uh, proposes. Well... Yeah, I mean, uh, I would not want to see that. And yeah. honestly, I, I, I mean, I, Star Spangled Crown. I mean, it's, it's give you guys levels of of what I'm talking about in Star Spangled Crown. One of my favorite understatement lines: uh, there, there are mass starvations in all around. It was a rough winter, as in, like, yeah, winters are more rough. You know, mass starvations. That's a cyclical okay. thing now. Makes it worse. Yeah. Yeah. It was a rough winter. <laughs> Master, well, and you know, the funny thing is, actually, this is an opera for anything, but I remember when I was writing it and putting myself into the mindset of my fictional great-nephew. In a lot of ways, if you think about it, he was like so many old Europeans who've spoken to or seen, who lived through the Depression and the wreckage of World War II. 
and it, it became normal to them. It's yeah. Like, yeah. And it, you know, and I, I lived through it, and you know, here we are now. Uh, I remember there was a um, a movie with Fred McMurray set in Singapore just after World War II, like maybe a year or two after. Mm -hmm. So if Fred McMurray goes into a bar he used to go into before the war. And this is the first time he's been in it since everything is in peace. So he says to the bartender, well, Jimmy, how was your war? <laughs> and the bartender says, oh, you know, whatever his name was. Uh, starvation, the internment camp, starvation, malaria, the usual. And the thing is, that was the way people talked about it then. Because they sewed it up inside. Wow. And they tried to go on as though nothing had happened. And some were more successful at it than others. Because that, when you have seen the unthinkable and the horrible, just... Well, if, if it doesn't destroy you, yeah, you just suck it up and you you, you do. Yeah. Um, and the funny thing is, on the one hand, I, I pray to God that our beloved country never goes through anything like that. But on the other hand, I'm all too aware that people being people and history being history, we probably are never going to get our brains sewn on tight again, if we ever do. Because that's the alternative. The alternative is that everything goes to hell and we don't catch on. Mm. And so we cease to exist as the country you see. We become something else. Well. And I, being raised on American heritage and, and uh, Norman Rockwell and Irving Berlin, I would like to see the United States survive and start Night of the Soul. Yeah. I have a more hopeful approach. I, I'm, I'm still pretty young, so I can be naively hopeful. Um, one of the uh, <laughs> one of the uh, one of the most inspiring things I was that I've ever heard was when you and I we, we went to uh, Michael Voris came to our parish. Yeah. And uh, a gentleman on the other side of the orange curtain, uh, uh, name of Mark McGrath, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, he is an upstanding uh, citizen, a Catholic citizen, and he so. But he opened for Michael Voris, and he and he said, you know, all of China before it was communist. It only took three hundred people to make all of China communist. Yeah. All of it, three hundred people. I and I and and, and the way, reason he was telling us is that it's possible mass evangelization. All it takes is three hundred. History people. is made by determined minorities. There you go. Mind you, those are three hundred people. Willing to spend their lives in the cause. Yeah. No. Of, of course. Of and course. That, well, you say of course, but I mean that's important to bear in mind. Most of us are not willing to do anything that will eject us from our comfort zone. Right. That's, that's one of the biggest things that I, I preach. I mean, it's well, it's, it's why we're such little bunnies. Yeah. I mean, stop and think about it for a second. Do you think? Uh, I mean, I don't want to point the finger at anyone in particular, but the moronic piece of garbage federal judge. That not down in Proposition 8. Mm. He's a member of some of the biggest clubs in this state. Do you think that if any of his colleagues have been willing to say publicly, you know what? You're a moron. You've destroyed the law, and being gay yourself, you should have recused yourself. Which he was, by the way. Wow. That's not my hyperbole. Okay. Uh, but there was no one to be found to say that. Because you want to, oh, what do they think of me? What if I can't get into the club? Oh, it'd be so awful. <sighs> well, okay, then you know what? If you're in that position, you don't like what he did, but you weren't willing to, to raise a hand against it? Eat it. Just so. No. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is really where we all are. Because you know what? All of us do that to some degree. Somewhere, someplace, ladies and gentlemen, we are cowards. And as long as the vast majority are cowards, the mold and the roaches will grow in the darkness. And when someone turns on the light and we see that the walls are all black and they're little skittery things, we go, oh, how could it be I did? Go look in the mirror and you'll find out. Well, I, I've been waiting to end the show, but do you really want to end on that? Cockroaches scattering in the lake?
<laughs> every day, in every way, we're getting better and better. And remember, for the next couple of weeks, if it's Monday, it's off the menu. <laughs>